Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Oh, we'll, we'll try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you, uh, uh, Luke, for inviting me and um, uh, for such a warm uh, welcome. I really uh, uh, immediately felt at home. I, I'm sort of uh, showered with a, a nice lunch and good company and presents. So, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, um, what I want to talk to you to about today is um, part of my ongoing uh, research at the Mertens Institute. Um, some of you may uh, know this institute under a, a different name, uh, the Bureau. Uh, it's also the title of a, um, a novel uh, in the 1990s written by uh, Johan Foskau, but that's a whole different story and shall be told another time. So the title of my uh, talk is uh, Religion, uh, Secularism and Political uh, Belonging. And I'll be talking about a specific uh, um, project in the Netherlands uh, uh, called the Cabra uh, Ancestor Mask. Um, so the culturalization of citizenship in the Netherlands, that is the increasing importance ascribed to culture in the politics of citizenship, belonging and integration, has been marked by a tension between religion and secularism. The culture of others, and Muslims in particular, is pitted against the secular, progressive and emancipated Dutch culture. Um, minorities are incre increasingly expected to integrate into Dutch culture and embrace Dutch norms, values and traditions. Integration here does not only uh, imply that minorities keep their culture to themselves, and out of the public sphere. It is also understood as a fundam fundamental transformation of the person, since they are thought to be caught in backward traditions. Pr prospective citizens have to emancipate themselves. This process of eman emancipation, in turn, is told as a narrative of secularization, so leaving religion behind. In his book on ritual citizenship, Oscar Verkaik, an uh, anthropologist at the University of Amsterdam, argues that, I quote, in this narrative, the acting, willing, rebelling individual is central. Against the grain of society, the individual breaks with social conventions of his milieu so as to let his personal autonomy flourish. End of quote. In other words, the Dutch citizen is not only seen as emancipated, but this emancipation is understood specifically as an emancipation from religion. In this lecture, I, I introduce people who make the opposite claim. Namely, that emancipation is achieved through religious practice. They understand emancipation not as a process of secularization, but as revaluation, indeed as an embrace of religion. I am talking here about the claims to, to citizenship articulated by some post-colonial migrants, more specifically a group of Surinamese uh, of uh, Dutch of African descent. The paradigmatic shift to integration in the 1990s and the ensuing search for Dutch culture, Dutch traditions and cultural heritage, um, and uh, Dutch history. So for instance, think of the uh, uh, debates about a, a historical museum uh, in the uh, first decade of the uh, 2000s. Um, so all of this uh, sort of uh, pre preoccupation with the past also turned up the so-called dark pages of Dutch history. In the early 1990s, Surinamese Dutch of African descent mobilized the colonial past, and in particular, the Dutch inv involvement in the transatlantic system of slavery, and in, uh, uh, to formulate uh, cl uh, claims to citizenship. As a consequence of slavery, they argued, they had been made citizens of the kingdom against their will, and now they should be treated as full Dutch citizens, not as second-class citizens with limi limited access to education, housing, labor market, and other areas of social life. For the self-identified descendants of the enslaved, full citizenship cons constitutes a way out of their subaltern position that would realize their true incorporation into the nation. In other, in other words, they understand citizenship as a form of emancipation, the realization of the promise held by the abolition of slavery to become truly free. Emancipation here refers, in one sense, to formal citizenship. Legally, the descendants of the enslaved residing in the Netherlands are Dutch. They hold a Dutch passport and are, in theory, regarded as Dutch citizens before the law. 
However, in practice, this status is often insufficiently realized due to conscious and unconsci un unconscious racial stereotyping and uh, discrimination. In this sense, emancipation refers to the practical implementation of the equality promised by the law. In another sense, emancipation also refers to cultural emancipation, that is, the revaluation of cultural forms and practices that have been suppressed or disavowed under colonialism. Similar to the ideas developed by the Harlem Renaissance or the Negritude movements, or also in the, in the context of, Dutch, of uh, Surinamese uh, nationalism, Emancipation here refers to a cultural politics in which the black person is to be rehabilitated as a cultural being. Such a cultural being emphatically includes religion, in particular the afro surinamese Vinti religion, according to the people concerned here, is to be unearthed from the rubble under which it has been buried by the Protestant and Catholic missions um, and the plantation regime, which were deeply, albeit often ambiguously, entangled with colonial rule in Suriname. Hence the notion of emancipation employed in the process of the culturalization of citizenship, emancipation here, or like the notion uh, of emancipation, uh, emancipation here refers to an emancipation from Christianity. However, this does not imply a process of secularization. In contrast to the notion of emancipation as secularization, so leaving religion behind, they articulate a critical position that does not take for granted the norm of secular modern modernity. Instead, secular and re religious modes of being and belonging intersect in their claims to citizenship, the nation, and indeed modernity. So modernity is often thought as something secular, the secular state, uh, uh, science, um, and um, uh, sort of uh, the rules and obligations that come with uh, uh, formal belonging, and here, the, uh, there, there's a different claim in which uh, this secularism is, um, uh, is uh, critiqued. So the material I discuss here urges us to rethink the relationship between Europe and its colon colonial others in the constitution of what has been mistaken to be European phenomena, the emergence of a secular public sphere and the supposed relegation of religion to the private sphere are not usefully rethought from a perspective that centers on Europe. This, only this not only entails enta en attention to the colonial margins, the spaces of en encounter between Europeans and others, uh, and its others. A post-secularist perspective, in my view, also entails provincializing Europe and understanding Europe as itself a frontier area and a contact zone. So these are some more theoretical remarks in the beginning. Hopefully uh, uh, they, they were clear enough, but um, uh, I, I think they will become clearer uh, as I present uh, the ethnography. So um, that's what I want to move uh, uh, to now. Um, and to do that, I want to take you to uh, Amsterdam. I'm not sure if anyone has um, been to this commemoration. Yes, one? Seen? <laughs> okay. So uh, some of you have been. Um, uh, uh, so what we see is uh, the commemoration of the annual commemoration of slavery in uh, Osterpark in Amsterdam. Uh, in the background, you see the um, slavery national slavery slavery memorial. In the foreground, Marian Markelo, who is pouring libation to the ancestors, and she's accompanied by uh, the Cabra ancestor mask. Um, now this is of course a national event uh, uh, now. Uh, and it was also in 2013, which was then the 150th jubilee of abolition. And um, next year we'll have another 150th uh, jubilee of uh, abolition, uh, uh, because of course there was a 10-year period of forced labor after abolition was uh, uh, after slavery was abolished in uh, uh, Suriname. So next year we'll cel celebrate the actual uh, abolition of slavery 150 years uh, ago. Um, now, this is, of course, a national event, um, and I see this uh, commemoration as a claim to citizenship, as I said. So it's, it's sort of the idea uh, that we have been uh, part of this kingdom for centuries, and we want to be treated as citizens now. And um, here, of course, you see the, the uh, nation embodied by ministers, um, envoys from the uh, Caribbean and Suriname, um, the uh, mayor, uh, and, of course, the king and the queen. So the nation um, is, is uh, being addressed by this um, uh, uh, commemoration. 
Now, in the remainder of the uh, lecture, what I want to do is unpack this event a little bit um, and sort of peel off uh, the different layers uh, of this uh, event to get a more uh, thorough understanding of what's <coughs> happening here. And in order to do that, uh, I need to go back uh, in time a little bit. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of a history lesson uh, to show how Vinti uh, uh, emerged. Now, this can, of course, not be understood uh, in isolation of uh, Dutch colonial and imperial history. Uh, I brought you a map uh, with the expanse of the uh, Dutch Empire. Of course, this is, not, is uh, sort of uh, anachronistic because not all of these um, areas have been Dutch colonies um, at the same time. Uh, but I want to focus on uh, Suriname in this case, which became a Dutch colony in 1667. Um, at the end of the Second uh, Anglo-Dutch uh, War, and in the Dutch had, had uh, uh, conquered uh, the British uh, the plantation colony uh, of uh, Guyana from the, Brit from the Brits, um, and in the treaty, uh, the peace treaty at the end of the war, um, it was said that uh, Suriname would become, uh, would, re would, would remain uh, a Dutch. Um, they traded actually uh, Suriname for uh, uh, New Amsterdam, uh, now New York, and at that time uh, that was considered quite a good deal because uh, the plantation uh, uh, in Suriname had uh, started to become profitable uh, and the Dutch could sort of uh, um, start a working uh, system. Uh, now things would be different, obviously. So this was the time when the West Indian Company entered the economic system uh, that's also known as the triangular uh, trade. Um, so uh, where uh, uh, manufactured goods were transported to Africa, where they were exchanged for human beings who were then enslaved and uh, set to work on uh, plantations in the Americas, in this case uh, Suriname, um, producing sugar in Suriname and uh, some, uh, some coffee uh, that was then transported back to uh, Europe and refined. And of course the profits for Europe uh, fluctuated over, the, over time but uh, in some, as my colleagues uh, from the International uh, Institute for Social History, the Ben Brandon and, and others have shown recently, uh, in some, uh, the profits were really substantial for uh, Europeans. And of course, needless to say, devastating for uh, everyone else in, involved, more or less. But um, this was not only a cultural, uh, an, uh, an economic system, it was also a cultural system that was later called uh, the Black Atlantic, by uh, Paul Gilroy and others. Uh, so uh, a cultural area uh, of black cultures that spans the uh, Atlantic uh, um, world, um, because of course people were transported to uh, the, the Americas and they weren't allowed to take anything, but of course they did take their cultural knowledge uh, to the new world. And they came from a huge area along the West African coast, but also far uh, in uh, inland. That's sort of the area where people were taken from. And it was a, uh, an area with huge cultural uh, and ethnic diversity. I brought you a map uh, to show um, the, the sort of different uh, ethnic groups uh, that uh, lived in this area. Um, now you have to imagine that all of these people were then randomly taken uh, on boats, um, and put together uh, on plantations where they worked. Um, not understanding each other's language often, um, not sharing the same culture, um, and um, so, so they had to find ways to uh, survive and communicate and uh, live together. Now, in this context, uh, all kinds of new cultural forms emerged. Um, in uh, uh, Brazil, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, Afro-Brazilian religion Candomblé uh, emerged on on Cuba, you got the Santeria uh, in, south, in the south of the US, uh, the uh, Voodoo, and in Suriname, uh, a similar uh, religion emerged, the Vinti. So what's, what's important to uh, note here is that from the start, uh, because these religious traditions were so different uh, from each other, uh, people were relying, relying on inventions. Uh, so they had to sort of form new cultures uh, as they went along. So it w the, the uh, cultures weren't uh, pre-existing, um, uh, but they had to be reinvented in a way. 
Now, in, the, in Suriname, uh, the Vinti uh, uh, religion um, uh, is uh, one of these syncre so-called so syncretistic uh, uh, religions, that is, uh, a religion formed out of different uh, elements and new additions uh, and new cultural forms, so syncretistic, diff putting different elements together. Um, it consists of, consists of a Vinti uh, pantheon with uh, the uh, upper uh, being Anana Gedwamang Gedwampung, uh, the creator of heaven and earth, who um, after creation withdrew and left sort of the day-to-day -day business to the lower deities, the Vinti. Um, next to the Vinti, there are also uh, other spiritual beings, uh, the ancestors. So the Vinti uh, are present in, in uh, the world. And the ancestors, um, well, uh, and the ancestors are spiritual beings that um, emerge from uh, human beings. So when people uh, pass away, uh, and um, uh, the correct rituals are followed, people after their deaths become uh, ancestors. Right. So, and the ancestors are, of course, uh, uh, a hugely important uh, spiritual presence for people uh, today. So it's also a bit of a connection to uh, the, uh, uh, the past, in a way. Uh, all of these spirits have to be appeased. They, uh, the relationship to them has to be, uh, have to be maintained, uh, for instance, by uh, organizing Vinti Prey, so dance events uh, that often last throughout the night. Um, Vinti also interfere in people's everyday lives, so they can be called upon to, for help. Uh, but if these relationships are not ma maintained properly, then they can also we wreak havoc on people's lives today. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very important influence in many people's lives uh, and now, uh, even though, uh, and I'll come to this in a minute, even though many people will say, I want nothing to do with uh, Vinti. Right? So you, s you still see uh, that people do wear uh, uh, earrings or rings or bracelets um, uh, that connect them to their Vinti, even though they claim, I have nothing to do with them. Or uh, they will uh, uh, um, conduct uh, uh, rituals, uh, for instance, with, uh, uh, with New Year's Eve, um, even though they claim, I, I want nothing to do with Vinti. Now, how is that uh, possible? Um, of course, you have to imagine Vinti emerged uh, under conditions of oppression. Uh, so, of course, you had the plant, uh, planting uh, uh, regime, uh, the plantation uh, regime, where planters, of course, tried to suppress uh, 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 the practice of Vinti, um, uh, which was only partly successful. Uh, they couldn't, they weren't able to uh, uh, suppress it completely. Um, so people still uh, uh, practiced uh, Vinti behind the plantations and in secret. Um, and the planters were also afraid of this uh, religion. Uh, so it, it, it was definitely, uh, even back then, a politics. Uh, so people sort of carved out their, uh, their space uh, in, in uh, a total institution of the plantation. Um, so you had a, a sort of the, the political ec economic uh, suppression of uh, Vinti. Uh, but uh, beginning in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the 18th century, uh, a new sort of uh, uh, force uh, entered um, uh, the stage, uh, the Protestant mission in the beginning. Um, a hundred years later, of course, the Catholics uh, uh, joined in. Um, but especially the pr uh, Protestants were very uh, negative about uh, uh, this so-called, this what they called African uh, religion. Um, completely rejected it as uh, superstition, um, as uh, uh, dangerous, um, and um, as uh, something that should be abolished. Huh? So that with their with their mission activities, they tried to eradicate uh, this. Uh, um, uh, African uh, religion. Um, what I do want to note, just briefly, uh, um, is that it, it was, uh, of course it was oppressive, uh, but it was also destabilizing. Um, uh, so the, the uh, beliefs um, of uh, the enslaved uh, also sort of eroded uh, 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 the Protestant certainty of, for instance, uh, uh, very clear distinctions between um, uh, the world and the divine, uh, 
between subjects and objects. So when uh, all of a sudden, when, when objects were alive, that was completely uh, unthinkable for the Protestants. Uh, a thing cannot live. But in the Vinti and in many African religions, that is something completely normal. Um, so uh, also the idea that if you make something with your hands, uh, a spirit could live in this uh, object. That's something very common in uh, African religions, but also in, in uh, African-American uh, religions, but something completely unthinkable for the Protestants. And um, in a way, they rejected it, but they were also afraid of it. And some mission missionaries, more than others, uh, also started to doubt. Right. Uh, so um, um, in a way, of course, it was pr uh, oppressive, but there was also a power in this uh, religion that uh, even the Protestant uh, missionaries uh, acknowledged. Now, let me turn to the Cabra Mas, because, of course, the project I'm presenting now addresses exactly this uh, uh, history, right? so, um, uh, or redresses this history, perhaps, uh, you could better say. It started, it's, it's a project by, uh, initiated by uh, Vinti Priestess uh, Marian Markelo, whom we've already uh, met. Um, and it started in 1998, not quite coincidentally also the year in which a petition was offered to the Dutch parliament uh, for what later became the slavery memorial. In that year, uh, Markelo's ancestors uh, contacted her and gave her the task to, as they called it, bring back the sculptural tradition into the Vinti practice. Because they said, we've lost our sculptural traditions, our religious art uh, during slavery, and now it's time to bring it back and restore it in honor. Now, this is, of course, a really difficult task, and it took uh, a while, uh, 13 years, before um, it started to materialize. 2011 was the year in which she met uh, the uh, Rotterdam-based uh, artist, uh, Boris von Berkham. And um, the ancestors immediately pointed him, him out and said, this is the man, you, he will help you in, in, uh, in your task. Partner up with him um, and uh, a project will emerge. And um, so it uh, happened. Uh, they uh, met uh, uh, during a Vinti Prey on, uh, in Rotterdam. Uh, not this one, but just to give you an idea of sort of their interpreta interpretation of it. And Van Berkham set to work and created what he calls African-inspired uh, scu uh, sculptures. Now, these sculptures were um, received well, uh, quite successful, were exhibited in um, uh, the prestigious Museum Boymans for Berningen. Um, they are uh, part of uh, uh, Markelow's altar, uh, and uh, were used in uh, Vinti Prey. So it was, it was reasonably successful, um, but Van Berkham said they, they're not quite what, what we were looking for. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They, they found them too static, just standing there on the altar. Um, and he said what, it would be good if they could dance with people, if people could really engage with, uh, with these objects, and um, if they were kinetic and instead of static, as he puts it. Um, so he developed the project further, and um, eventually came up with the idea to, uh, as he calls it, go where the African ancestors live in the Netherlands, um, namely the museum collections of the Dutch, uh, 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 the Africa collections of uh, Dutch Musea. So they went to uh, the uh, Africa Museum in, uh, in Bergendal and um, selected, guided by the ancestors, of course, uh, selected uh, a number of masks, mainly Yoruba masks. I'll uh, um, uh, go back to that map again. So this is the, the sort of area where the masks uh, come from. They, the masks are not necessarily pre-colonial. Uh, some of them are 20th century, some 19th century. But important for them was that they were made by the ancestors, right, as they, call, as they say. So the ancestors were asked for permission, uh, and uh, permission was granted. And uh, uh, Van Berkham set to work uh, to, this is a, a sort of a commercial uh, uh, scanning uh, uh, firm. Um, they took the masks, made 3D scans uh, of the masks, then rendered them uh, uh, on the computer, uh, then milled them uh, into uh, form, so it's kind of a building uh, material used for insulation that is both light and sturdy. Uh, 
and then made a sort of an, a more or less exact copy of uh, the original. And out of that uh, um, uh, raw material, uh, von Birken ma made this new uh, ancestor mask. Now, this is, of course, rich, of, uh, rich in symbolism. And, um, um, for instance, did the, um, uh, the colors uh, refer to the ancestors. So the ancestral colors are often uh, blue and white or black and white. Uh, the brass powder on, uh, on the face uh, of the mask refers to uh, one particular uh, Vinti Mama Aisa, one of the most important ones. Um, uh, importantly, the uh, uh, mask can be carried uh, on someone's head. It's also a bit bigger than the original. Um, uh, to, uh, because as von Berkham said, well, uh, the original was made for uh, an African village, um, but... Uh, the new one uh, is, of course, for our times, and um, uh, it uh, also has to do well on television, he said. Uh, so now this mask uh, was introduced um, into the community. Uh, here we see an ancestor worship in uh, Rotterdam, where um, the, the, com sort of the uh, community saw the mask for the first time. Um, of course, not knowing exactly what, how to treat it and uh, what to do with it. Uh, but in the end, uh, people were also pleased, and it worked quite well. Um, then, of course, it becomes uh, 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 a part of uh, what we've uh, already seen. Uh, the national uh, commemoration becomes part of a more... Uh, so so uh, it, it, it was introduced into the religious community, communi community but here it also becomes part of a political community. Yeah? So not just the Vinti uh, uh, practitioners, but also uh, the um, black community or the African Surinamese community in the Netherlands as a political subject uh, that is sort of visualized here. And as I said, addresses uh, the secular nation. Uh, it, this is uh, another commemoration, uh, also uh, an, an another uh, year of the same commemoration, also in Osterpark, where a group of uh, uh, young people, um, um, well, actually prevented uh, uh, the then minister uh, uh, Asar uh, from uh, ho giving his speech, because they said we are not going to let him speak until uh, he promises to. Uh, uh, address uh, racism in the Netherlands. We're sick and tired of it, um, you know, of, of not getting jobs, of not getting uh, the right uh, advice for school and so on and so forth. And, but they did so in invoking, by invoking the ancestors. So they uh, uh, laid a claim on uh, the ancestors uh, in, uh, to sort of um, uh, uh, support uh, uh, their political claim. Uh, the mask then, I mean, this is the, the public library in, in Rotterdam, and I just wanted to show you this um, to sort of uh, underline that the, the uh, uh, point with all of this is really to make a statement, right? To uh, have a, a six-meter uh, statue of Mama Isa in uh, a public space in, in the Netherlands. That they, so they're really out to make, uh, make a, a splash in a way. Um, and the last images are from... Uh, uh, Avinti Balmaske, another uh, invention for uh, surrounding this mask. Um, so there, there are several uh, um, sculptures that uh, were made here. You see the, the mask, the Cabra mask. Um, and this took place in, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. Is the Um, so this took place in the uh, Laudenskerk in, uh, in uh, Rotterdam. Um, and of course, also to make a statement, and as Boris said, isn't it wonderful that now we can have a Vinti pray in a Protestant uh, church? Right? So they're explicitly, explicitly addressing this uh, uh, history of, uh, of um, uh, colonialism. So to conclude, in the Netherlands, the colonial past has been the subject of a heated debate by raising the colonial past the self-identified -ident descendants of the enslaved articulate claims to Dutch citizenship, arguing that formally they've been part of this nation for centuries, yet their claims are not exclusively made within a secular framework, as I hope to have shown, 
of formal citizenship. They intervene in what has been called the culturalization of citizenship, but in claiming citizenship, they take a critical stance. The interventions presented in this lecture are issued from within what Paul Gilroy has called a counterculture counter of modernity, pointing to the fu uh, fundamental entanglement of black cultures with modernity. <coughs> the ethnography suggests that in this counterculture, secul secular and religious modes of binding and belonging intersect. It, inv it invites, if not urges, a different understanding of modernity um, that does not take enlightened rationality and secularism as its self-evident foundation and religion as its other, it directs instead attention to the complex dynamics and processes of secularization and sacra, so secularization and sacralization in racial modernity. This means that we need to take seriously the role of religion in projects of post-colonial emancipation. The embrace of religion has consequences in the context of the Netherlands, where postcolonial critique is often framed as secular critique, directed as historic at historiography, museums, or cultural heritage. Perhaps this is a particularity of the Dutch context, where the quite rig rigorous process of depolarization has had far-reaching impl implications for religious authority in schools, the academy, and the cultural sector. So it's thoroughly secular secularized in a sense. But Markelow's emphasis on religion and the genealogy of Surinamese nationalism in which this investment is situated bears significance beyond the particularity of the Surinamese Dutch context. The fact that the ancestors are mobilized in claims to citizenship poses an interesting challenge, I would say, to the notion of secular critique, central to post-colonial studies and personified most prom prom prominently by Edward Seed. In Humanism and Democratic Criticism, in his book, Humanism and Democratic Criti Criticism, for instance, Said endorsed, I quote, the secular notion that the historical world is made by men and women and not by God, and that it can be understood rationally, end of quote. Said's argument was, of course, against the essentialist belief in absolute truth and unchanging essences. For, I quote, to take human phenomena out of the reach of change is to give oneself over to metaphysics and theology, end of quote. But this stance also implied a refusal to engage with the meta meta metaphysics of cosmology and co to engage with metaphysics and cosmology. And indeed, Said often seems to explicitly reject the role of religion in projects of liberation, emphasizing instead its destructive power. What the case of the Cabra mask shows, I think, is not only that some people of African descent do not fully adhere to the framework of secular critique, it also shows that, as Leroy Medevoy and Elizabeth Bentley argued recently, that religion may take itself, uh, may, it ta may itself take on secular concerns such as citizenship. Markelow, but also the numerous religious figures who have engaged in anti-colonial and civil rights struggles may be seen as secular critics in the sense that as religious persons, they bring their passionate concerns into the world. In the broadest sense, what these entanglements of religion, citizenship, and colonialism show is that the idea of neat and stable distinctions between secularism, modernity, the West on the one hand, and religion and racialized others on the other is impossible to maintain. Instead, these categories have to be understood as spilling over into each other, informing one another, and always involving trans uh, processes of translation and mediation. Thank you. No, I, I don't think it's unique. And, and I mean, I focus on this uh, uh, case, you could say. Uh, but I don't think it's it's unique at all. I, uh, I, th I mean, if you, for instance, think of the civil rights struggle in the U.S., uh, religion has always played a central role. I mean, think of Martin Luther King, but also, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, all of the people who who uh, uh, converted to Islam, uh, uh, civil rights activists. So um, their uh, religion has always played a different uh, role. Um, but also think of uh, the various liberation theologies in, in South America, for instance, 
Uh, so it's it's not it's not unique. I mean, even even Salafism is in a way a, a, a sort of a political theology, you could say. Um, so um, it's not unique, and I think that's the point, right? So it's it, it's not sort of an um, um, an, an aberration or something, uh, but it's it's that's why I think it, I say it invites or urges us to think. Uh, uh, cr critique differently also and to think of the role religion can play and has played in it as well. Right, um, so I think there are several questions in one. Uh, <laughs> the question of uh, uh, religion is a tricky one, um, uh, also a political one, I would say, uh, because, uh, for instance, people like Maria Markelo insist that um, Vinti is a religion, uh, and by that they mean it's um, equal to other uh, phenomena that are referred to as religion, such, such as Christianity or uh, Islam or Buddhism. Um, so, in discussing whether or not something is religion or spirituality, I think that is something you have to uh, keep in mind. Um, I personally um, don't know whether the distinction is um, can be made in the first place and whether it's important to make a distinction because uh, um, there is so much overlap, and I think that's what I'm what I'm trying to argue, um, uh, that it's much more important to uh, look at how it's being discussed and how it's being lived and practiced. Um, so, so that would be a, an argument for um, ethnography rather than um, defin defining what it is or what it isn't. Um, then uh, I think the more, it's perhaps even a theological question, uh, the relationship between ancestors and, and Vinti, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, there are different kinds of spirits in a way, um, because the Vinti have always existed in the world, um, uh, and uh, some of them are African. For instance, Mama Aisa is, is, uh, is a Vinti that came uh, on the boat. Uh, but there are other Vinti, for, for instance, the Inji Vinti, uh, who were already present in, in Suriname. Um, and they are, they are ancient, you could say. Um, uh, they have been here uh, for, forever, uh, um, but, um, or since the beginning of the world, anyway. Uh, but the ancestors haven't, right? So they um, uh, are spirits that um, are created from people, right? So, and and that's, that's the difference between the Vinti and, uh, and the ancestors. W how they relate on a spiritual level, I'm not sure. I'd have to, uh, th that's a good question. I'll, uh, I'll take that uh, to the next um, uh, interview with uh, Marianne. <laughs> it's a good question. Then I think there was another one, the wasn't there? Between community life, which is also called right, right. Um, I'm not sure if I can, I, I'm, I don't think I know enough about Ubuntu to make a, 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 um, make a valid uh, claim uh, here. Uh, what I do want to say is that um, uh, the Vinti cosmology is um, a com communitarian one. So in, in Vinti uh, belief, the individual is not something that is uh, detached from the world. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's, never, uh, it's, it's always a relation. Uh, so you're always in relation with all kinds of different uh, spiritual entities, but also with, uh, with uh, uh, other people. Um, so in that, in that it differs um, to a certain extent, I would say, from, for instance, uh, uh, Protestantism. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I don't think you can make that distinction like, like that. Um, I, uh, uh, the, the in, in Brazil, the, that influence is, is perhaps stronger. Um, but, uh, of course, people, the, the slave traders didn't note down which uh, uh, tradition people were from. So it's impossible to say 
what kind of percentage or, or I mean that's that's really difficult and it I mean also you have to um, um, keep in mind that slavery lasted for um, more than 300 years um, so it's it's an extended period in which people came from different parts of Africa uh, so it wasn't uh, that they came all at once so that, and and sometimes more came from you know, one area and and uh, in an, in, an, in a different time it wasn't a different area so it's very difficult to say uh, what exactly the influences are and it, I, I would say even in in brazil uh, it, it, it's it's not that um, uh, clear cut Well, I mean, it's a good point, I, I think, uh, because, I mean, there, there's a tension between um, a, a, an object becoming cultural heritage uh, and an object uh, uh, as a religious object, right? Um, and, um, and that makes the mask, I think, such an interesting case to study as an anthropologist, because it sort of moves between different um, discourses, if you like, between different domains, um, so religion, uh, cultural heritage. It's also part of the collection of the Amsterdam Museum, for instance, um, and um, and then it's also a, a work of art, right? It's made by an artist um, who has to live also from his uh, making his art. Um, so there are different interests and and different um, regimes, if you want, uh, involved, um, uh, and the mask sort of has to uh, um, yeah straddle straddle them in a way. Um, and sometimes that leads to uh, conflict, but sometimes it also uh, just leads to um, innovation. For instance, um, the, uh, the, of course, the, the museum acquired the mask, um, and um, uh, that made, uh, in that way, the, the project could pay for itself. Um, and of course, they were quite pleased. It was sort of a, also a success. Huh? So, so that was the, the whole idea to be part of this kind of uh, collection. Uh, but they said, well, um, uh, we do have a condition, and that's that we have to be able to use that object as a religious object um, and not treat it as cultural heritage with white gloves. And, stuff. and for the museum, that was a huge uh, thing, right? Because, I mean, uh, even when musea loan objects to each other, um, it's, it's, it's always a, a, a big thing, and, and you have to think of insurance, transport, uh, you know, the environment has to be right and so forth. Um, and then so, so um, it, uh, it was um, really new for the museum to, uh, to then loan that object to a religious community who could do all kinds of things with it. And I was at one meeting where one of the curators said, um, or one of the conservators of the museum said, uh, well, what happens if the object is damaged when, while out there? Um, and Bora said, well, I will just make a new one because I could just print a new one. But then they said, well, but this object was present at the 150th uh, uh, Jubilee, so it's a historic object in itself. It can't be replaced like that. And then the conservator said, well, but there are different um, um, uh, kinds of damage. So, for instance, uh, if the object breaks, of course, that's unwanted kind of damage. Uh, we don't want that. Um, but if you could sprinkle some chicken blood on the object, that would be great because it's you know it gives the object patina and so in a way it increases the value for the for the museum. I mean, the, unfortunately, there's no chicken blood involved in Vinci, but uh, this is how um, uh, this uh, mask and this object is discussed uh, between the museum and and the uh, community, you could say, uh, and it leads in. A, it, it's also part of history. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's also why they call me the chronicler of the project. <laughs> um, and um, uh, uh, um, it, so, so that's it leads to religious innovation, but also uh, to uh, innovation in the museum sector. So, uh, yeah, well, maybe a longer answer than. than <laughs>
Um, well, maybe to start with the second answer, I think it was sort of a similar answer to, uh, uh, to a similar question to the uh, one just asked. Um, I, I, I think that's really difficult. Um, and of course, I mean, th this mask isn't, uh, uh, this mask you can trace uh, because the museum has records and, and you, you can, you, you know who made it uh, uh, and, and how it got here. Um, but um, to, to then say, well, the, you know, Vinti is, is more Yoruba or more Fante or wh whatever, that, that's really difficult. Um, now, the, the first question um, is, is uh, also interesting um, uh, because, I mean, the relation to Africa is, 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 is of course, there's, there are different kinds of Africa, so uh, one has to be specific, what, what are we talking about? Um, now, there are, of course, in the Netherlands, uh, quite a few um, a African churches, and most of them are Pentecostal churches. Um, they completely reject uh, the mask, um, if, if, they bo uh, if they're bothered about it at all. Uh, they would say, that's devil, that's the devil, and it, it, we have to stay away from it, right? So, so they're sort of the uh, hyper-Protestants, in a way. Um, but uh, uh, Marian often travels to Ghana, and um, there she also consults with um, uh, um, uh, well, uh, religious authorities from, the, from traditional religions, and um, she discusses the mask. And sometimes they have... Um, differences and uh, theological disputes in a way, uh, but they're also really interested in what's happening with, uh, with this mask. So it's, um, I mean, there's not one stance in a way, uh, but it, it does feed back. Yeah. Thank you.